This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. And now, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Mark Seidler. Mark has more than 20 years of experience, including asset development strategy, new product development strategy, and corporate portfolio strategy for global companies in Europe, the United States, and Asia. Mark has led SDG's European consulting operations since 2012, and last year, he was named Chief Executive Officer. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you, Lindsay. And let me extend my welcome as well to everyone who has joined us today on this important topic. I'd like to begin by mentioning that SDG is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Uh, to celebrate this milestone, we're conducting a series of webinars featuring, featuring SDG's thought leadership in the domain of decision quality and decision science in general. Today's webinar on how best to evaluate early stage projects and make portfolio decisions is one in this series. I'm pleased to introduce our featured presenter today, Deepak Divabhagavan. Deepak is based in SDG's Dusseldorf office where he leads the firm's global life science practice as well as the strategy consulting practice in, in Europe. Um, he, he's led client teams in strategy development, portfolio management, change management, decision process design projects, and recently has been uh, working with pharmaceutical companies to implement groundbreaking prioritization methodology that uses multi-attribute utility theory to aid R&D decision-making, um, particularly at the early stage of the pharmaceutical pipeline when long-term value potential is particularly difficult to assess. The case study Deepak will refer to today is drawn from the work he and our colleagues at SDG have developed in life sciences, but I'd like to call out that this approach can be applied in many other industries and in many other contexts. Um, Any time in particular where investment decisions must be made today for products or projects that will uh, not be in the market for years or even decades for that matter. Um, Deepak, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, Mark. I'm happy to be here and happy to share the approach that we have developed uh, for uh, tackling this important challenge that many industries and companies are facing. Very good. Um, also with us today is Inza Zoma, a consultant in our Düsseldorf office. Inza will be answering some of the quest questions you submit today using the questions panel and uh, passing some of your questions along to us to answer at the end, um, if time allows. Um, so welcome, Inza. Thank you, Mark. So uh, we're going to get started, um, and we're going to start uh, with a poll. And uh, there'll be a couple of polls today. And uh, th the first question that we'd like you to answer is, uh, is which of the following reasons was most important in your choice to attend today's webinar? Um, for example, I'm involved in decisions for long lead time investments, or I want to value investments that have a long time horizon, or I have a general interest in portfolio management, or I'd like to stay abreast of innovations in decision science. And I must say, uh, getting uh, input on this, getting input on your motivation for attending the webinar is very important to us because it allows us to um, identify the next subjects, identify what we should have overall on our agenda of webinars. Um, it also has a broader impact on us thinking about what's of interest to our audience and um, evolving our offerings um, overall. Um, and I think um, we're um, continuing to get a good amount of um, input at this time. Uh, it looks like the the results are um, starting to stabilize at this point. And so um, let, I would say the last people cast your last votes. And then Lindsay, if you could 
close the poll and we'll take a look at these results. Um, and it looks like the, the most of the people here, almost half the people are actually involved in actually making the decisions, long lead time investments. Um, so it sounds like we have a good set of decision makers participating today. So I think this will be um, particularly um, interesting in that con context because you'll have an opportunity to reflect on what motivates your decisions and how to deal with that, how to, how to capture that. I, before talking too long, I'll hand over to Deepak right now to get into the content. Thank you, Mark. If you can close the poll now, please. Okay, so um, it's good to see the level of interest in this um, in challenging problem. This is a very hard problem and it's challenging in many ways. And you would find these in um, a lot of industries. Decisions around long lead investments typically involve a great deal of uncertainty because the outcome of a decision can only be seen years later. While we face uncertain situations all the time, there are a few aspects that make this uh, long lead investments more challenging than usual. So let's take a look at a few examples to understand the challenges better. So in pharmaceutical industry, drug development often takes 10 to 20 years. COVID vaccine development is probably the only exception so far. Normally, projects which require decisions right now do not expect to generate a cash flow for the company before, say, 2031. That does not reduce the significance of these decisions. These may be decisions around continuing to invest in drug candidates for diseases that may be relevant 20 to 10 to 20 years from now, or uh, getting a partner to develop the drug together so that you can share the costs, or even uh, buying a molecule from someone else. When the data is uncertain and the investments are very diverse, making consistent decisions in line with a corporate strategy gets more challenging. How do you compare investing in a, ca a cancer treating R&D activity with a spontaneous need to invest and focus resources on vaccine development? Let's take um, another example in a different industry. Let's energy, for instance. Currently, the energy intensive industries are considering alternative energy sources. Hydrogen is one such promising energy source. Switching to hydrogen would reduce the emissions, helping companies and countries move closer towards the global sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. However, investment in infrastructure for alternate energy is a big bet that is not expected to pay up in the short term. So how would you value such an investment especially if the alternative is to invest in an existing technology that will yield cash flow in the short term. Digitalization is another topic that's relevant today. Recently, I came across the example of a large financial services company which was trying to implement an AI machine learning platform across all their processes. This was a mammoth effort costing millions of dollars over a five-year time period. This also requires a large change management effort. So the question on everyone's mind was, what returns will this investment bring? And more importantly, is this worth the effort? Now, um, there are a lot of approaches currently to make decisions in uncertain environments. Many of these are well established and work well in certain situations, but not necessarily in long lead decisions. First, let's look at the qualitative approaches, say a questionnaire or heat maps or a signals, uh, traffic signals with various descriptors like risk and price, safety, commercial potentials, etc. These qualitative approaches typically remain on an abstract level, and as a result, getting to a meaningful differentiation of options remains difficult. Furthermore, for investment decisions in different areas, Consistency in decision-making is rarely achieved. For advanced evaluations, quantitative approaches using financial metrics like the NPV, net present value, certainly play a dominant role. For short-term investments, for those where a company is very experienced, an expert's judgment and predictions are broadly accepted. However, this is not the case when the lead time is long, or in the case of innovative projects, 
where the company has limited experience. Here, the large number of unknown uncertainties undermine the credibility of detailed assessments. To summarize, um, a complete model for a net present value analysis that would show meaningful difference across alternatives would require an unreasonably high effort. It is difficult to capture uncertainty in a transparent and acceptable way. Second, um, the high degree of uncertainty also leads to uh, limited confidence in the NPV that's calculated. There is a general belief among decision makers that financial value in long lead time investments cannot be properly determined. As a result, low risk alternatives with shorter time horizons tend to be preferred more. Third, in the absence of a clear guidelines for decision making, in a commonly accepted methodology across different decision areas, the decisions are prone to distortions. In the end, long lead time innovation investments remain susceptible to biases, demonstrating the continued need for introducing a more systemic process to making decision uh, making more robust. So let us look at um, what are the key challenges that must be overcome to make decision making more robust and consistent, specifically when it comes to long lead items. Number one, talking about objectives. Objectives need to be aligned across the organization and specifically within the group of decision makers. That means stating clearly what is about to be achieved with a decision. So the group of decision makers need to reflect on why they are considering the investment and push for reasons more and more until they reach their fundamental objectives. Imagine your research unit focusing on being first in class while development unit focuses on being best in class. These objectives need to be aligned and clearly communicated. Second, stating the objectives alone is not sufficient. You need to have an agreed order of preference and this needs to be as detailed as possible. There's no reason, for example, in agreeing that sustainability is an important objective for the company, when in reality, decision makers would not sacrifice any financial metric for an increase in sustainability. And finally, systemic biases, distortions that mislead our decisions. Typically, biases are categorized into motivational and cognitive biases, Motivational biases, for example, occur when a project team becomes too attached to its idea. The project team then tends to overestimate the chances and overlook their obstacles. Cognitive biases are a result of our limited cognitive capabilities leading to um, systemic biases. So uh, Deepak, it's, uh, I think it's time for another poll. Um, and so um, I'm going to read this and then ask for your input again from, uh, from all the participants. So uh, the question is, what kinds of problems do you experience in your company um, in regard to making these types of decisions? Um, is it about uh, decision makers with different objectives or diverging preferences in weighting those objectives? Or is it about systemic biases in the organization um, or all of the above for that matter. And so um, please um, start to make uh, your entries at this time. And, uh, you know, uh, Deepak, in the course of your presentation, you mentioned uh, an example of a bias in the sense that uh, organizations tend to lean toward the, the shorter term investments because they can assess them better. Uh, the question that I have to you is, where do you find this uh, biased behavior primarily? Are you talking about the input assessment um, in looking at different um, options or are, in, in the people making that assessment? Or is it more the decision makers themselves that have biases? Um, it is um, a very interesting question. And often we look at the input assessments and the people uh, who are providing those inputs, the experts, and think about biases there. And there's a lot of um, uh, ways we could tackle that. But in reality, there are biases amongst decision makers as well. And um, it's, it's not often that we identify that. And one of our objectives through this methodology is to capture 
and bring out those biases or objectives uh, to the open. And in a way, uh, Mark, talking about biases right now, out of the three options, we may already be biasing the team, uh, uh, the set of participants here into voting more on the third one. Doesn't yeah, look you, you caught me. <laughs> um, very good. Um, it looks like the, the voting has uh, come to an end. And so, Lindsay, I'd ask you to close the poll and let's have a look at the results. And um, uh, it looks like each of the different categories here, um, having different objectives, weighting the objectives differently, or having biases in general, are about equally weighted. In other words, amongst themselves. And so it's not surprising that all of the above are prominent um, in the, the, uh, the observations of the participants. Very good. So let's close the, the poll off and let's go back to the presentation. Back to you, Deepak. Thank you, Mark. Um, it is, um, yeah, um, it's easy to see that a lot of people have faced similar challenges. And what I would like to do now is to look at the approach that we have developed to overcome these challenges using an example. This is a life sciences example, but you can apply the approach to many different industries. So think about your own industry while we go through the example. In pharmaceutical R&D, drug candidates follow a well-defined stage-gated process. The typical process for developing a new drug starts in research and discovery. In research, tens of thousands of compounds are usually screened, either exploratively or driven by an hypothesis to affect a particular target mechanism until one candidate is selected. This candidate is subsequently transferred to development. Drug development is the most expensive part of the journey of a potential drug. 2.5 billion is the average cost estimate for successfully bringing a drug to the market. Manufacturing, advertising, and selling a drug um, for the benefit of the patient complete the value chain. The whole process of R&D often takes 10 to 20 years. In early stage development, development progress and pipeline balance are frequently monitored. Furthermore, each drug candidate is regularly assessed with both qualitative and quantitative indicators to adjust portfolio composition by prioritizing individual assets. At this early stage, drug candidates often have yet to prove their efficacy in the human body and a lead indication, which describes the primary medical need that's about to be served is still subject to change. This leads to a high degree of uncertainty regarding the prioritization decision, and sets very difficult demands on decision-making methodologies. The decisions that need to be made involve selecting the right drug candidate, um, ranging from say small molecules to cell and gene therapy, selecting the right indication, so the area of actual application, and also development options around trial design and timing. Given this context, it's important to make the right decisions, identify the right drugs, and bring um, these innovations to the market. Only then, the unmet medical need can be addressed and the quality of life improved. So let us look at a combination of the decision analytical concepts that we have used. Many listeners to this webinar series may be familiar with decision quality framework. The framework of decision quality describes the essential demands on a systemic decision methodology. Appropriate frame, creative alternatives, relevant and reliable information, clear values and trade-offs, sound reasoning, and commitment to action. Methodologies for early stage development decisions described to date actually do not fulfill all of these requirements. Early stage de uh, decisions are different due to the high degree of ambiguity. Not only is there a high degree of uncertainty in being used in the clinical practice, the full breadth of applications can often not be foreseen. So current methodologies don't address this problem. Instead, they focus on technical determinants of a drug candidate, leaving objectives outside of consideration. Without clarity on the objectives and how to deal with conflicting objectives, decision makers are not able to decide in the interest of the company. In ambiguous situations, they shy away from more risky innovation, which ultimately leads to low innovation bias and low R&D productivity. While uncertainty is inherent in pharmaceutical business, the lack of clear values and trade-offs, a fundamental uh, requirement of decision quality is something that we can address. The first uh, 
we used the value focused thinking framework developed by Ralph Keeney to support the development of a set of fundamental objectives that are complete, operationalizable, decomposable, non redundant, and minimal. In standard cash flow models, important insights get lost because information and knowledge do not fit to the model. In contrast, we start by really focusing on the fundamental value drivers of early stage drug development candidates upfront. We then used um, a multi criteria decision making approach called multi attribute utility theory MOUT as a basis for evaluation and comparison. Due to its clarity and transparency, MOUT is very helpful in reducing the ambiguity that leads to the low innovation bias. On the one hand, the simplicity allows for easily distinguishing alternatives and the transparency ensures acceptance and understanding by decision makers. With MAUD, we aggregate the value of an alternative from its individual performance against the fundamental objectives. This approach also supports sound reasoning by providing a clean structure that weights various aspects on a rational basis. Weighting of different fundamental objectives and trading them off is the challenging part. We use the Entscheidungs Navi, a free online decision support tool developed by RWTH Aachen that we are closely cooperating with to create clarity for decision makers. It helped us to visualize preferences so that the decision makers can have a better understanding of the situation. So time um, for uh, another poll. Um, and so we can keep our participants on their toes. Um, and we'd like you to, uh, if you could start the poll, Lindsay, and um, what, we, uh, what we want to know is what is your experience in using uh, value-focused thinking and uh, multi-attribute utility theory in decision-making? Um, and so you might answer, I have used it at at least one of these frameworks or I've heard of these frameworks, but have not used them, or maybe these frameworks are new to you. So please start um, providing your your input on that. Um, and um, you know, one of the questions that I think often comes up in a discussion about these uh, frameworks is actually how do you get to the the fundamental objectives when you're talking about value focused thinking? And uh, Deepak, can you say a little bit more about that? Actually, how you actually get to them? Sure, Mark. Um, this is um, one of the two challenging aspects of this approach. Um, we need to have conversations with the decision makers, and we need to push them to ask. So, why is that important? I mean, I talk to them about objectives, they would talk about um, a number of objectives. But when you ask them, so why is this objective important? And if the answer is another objective, then the first objective is just a means objective, means to an end. So what we want to do using these conversations is to go down that objective hierarchy to a point where um, when you ask them the question, why is this important? They say it is important because it is. So that is the point where you can actually get to a fundamental objective. Very good, um, thank you. And uh, it looks like the voting is complete. Um, so um, let's take a look at the results. And um, we have a pretty evenly uh, split set of participants here. We have some people who have experience in this space and we have uh, about the same number of novices. Um, so uh, I hope that we're uh, providing uh, information of interest to both groups. Um, let's uh, go back to the presentation, back to you, Deepak. Thank you, Mark. Yes, and um, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about um, these approaches and how we actually used this um, in the project in a bit more detail. So the first step is to define the frame. And once we defined the decision problem, we spent a lot of time and effort in identifying the fundamental objectives. In interviews, we challenged the decision makers to reveal their fundamental objectives. Um, we stimulated their thinking process by asking this question about, so why is this important? This helped clarify and differentiate the means objectives from the fundamental objectives. We then developed objective hierarchies, adapting the structure with ideas from literature and experience. 
this is an important step that lays the foundation for the entire effort. Then, in the second step, we created meaningful scales to operationalize the fundamental objectives using the expertise, scientific expertise within the company. You can measure um, distance in miles or kilometers. You can measure time using days or hours. But how do you measure abstract topics like innovation? You have to be creative about it. Um, for instance, you can use the number of publications or how many times a topic is discussed in a conference. Or you can think about uh, making it more tangible and use something like uh, and evaluate the mechanism of action, for instance. These scales have two purposes. One is to evaluate and compare alternatives. The other is to make trade-offs tangible. The second important challenge in this approach is how do you facilitate trade-off discussions with the decision makers? This is as challenging as defining the fundamental objectives. We compared one fundamental objective at a time with the other objectives to calculate the overall weights for each decision maker. We did not use pairwise comparisons or AHP. We used concrete scales and examples on what the decision maker was willing to sacrifice in one objective to get to the other objective. Earlier, I mentioned the example of sustainability. Everyone thinks that sustainability is important. However, you cannot work with the statement until you know how much someone is willing to sacrifice to achieve that objective. Scales help to understand these importances and allow you to act on them. Finally, the entire portfolio of early stage assets was assessed using this methodology. Before I show you the outcome of the analysis, I would like to emphasize the importance of clear roles and responsibilities in this process. And you will see that in the different colors we have used in this process. Agreeing on value drivers and identifying fundamental objectives are the core of every strategic decision. These steps need to be addressed together with the decision makers. They are the ones that need to express their beliefs on how the company is affected by achieving the objectives. And honestly, um, they also know the ones who know what company success looks like and actually means. On the other hand, the evaluation of different drug candidates is not a question of preferences. It is a question of evidence. And the evaluation then becomes a task for those stakeholders who are experts in their fields and can provide objective assessments. Let's now look at some of the sample outputs that we have created from this exercise. In the picture on the left, you can see how the various drug candidates rank against each other. You can see them ranked by disease areas, and you could do the same across different phases of development if you have just one therapeutic area. This comprehensive overview of all the decisions that the decision makers faced, and given that the evaluation was consistent across assets, made this comparable. Therefore, they were able to make decisions, including reallocation of resources, using this very quickly. On the right, you can also see uh, an overview of how the portfolio looks and to what extent the portfolio meets the fundamental objectives. So you can use this as a tool to drive growth in areas where you see the need. Similarly, since this is a transparent overview, transparent to the project teams, the BDE teams or the project teams can also look for assets that aim to complete the overall portfolio. So that's in a nutshell, a uh, couple of sample outputs and how we derived some of the uh, insights into this. So the benefits that we saw in this example go towards addressing the three challenges I talked up front. By separating discussions about scientific expectations from strategic discussions about preferences and objectives, all activities became more focused, and this increased the efficiency of the decision-making process. Communicating criteria and how portfolio decisions are made enabled each project team to work towards making their project a better fit within the overall portfolio. Um, objective weights of different decision-makers were also shared with each other, creating transparency within the decision-making group. This transparency made it easier to have open discussions about, say, for example, how much were they willing to sacrifice the traditional desire to have high chance of success to, um, say, getting more differentiated products that had greater benefits to patients and society. The discussion of the reasons behind diverging preferences 
helped to attain a lot of clarity and a common understanding of the corporate strategy. In particular, openly agreeing that innovation often contrasts with the likelihood of uh, launch, and but that innovation is an important strategic preference, increase the overall commitment to the set of preferences. Finally, um, coming back to biases, we put in place a lot of de-biasing measures and clarified the roles and responsibilities that helped us identify, uh, that helped us to ensure a quick and a consistent quality check across different projects. That's um, a quick overview of what we did. In summary, current decision-making methodologies are not able to effectively handle the uncertainty of long-term early development decisions. Assets are not meaningfully differentiated, which leads to ambiguity for the decision makers. They avoid the unknown unknowns and focus on low risk projects, ultimately leading to less innovation. When we first focus on value drivers and identify a clear set of fundamental objectives, the necessary transparency is created. Decision makers are then confident that they are in fact considering all of their objectives, which immediately affects the importance of innovation. This leads to more information, more innovation. The methodology unearthed the uh, strengths and weaknesses of multiple projects in the portfolio. Looking at how each project performed across the different fundamental objectives in a deconstructed way led to prioritization of projects with corresponding reallocation of investments. We created transparency and visibility within the organization into how portfolio decisions are made so that each project team became aware of the criteria and could work towards making their project a better fit within the overall portfolio. We improved the efficiency of the decision-making process. We separated discussions about scientific expectations from strategic discussions about preference and objectives. Consequently, the projects were assessed across the scales by project expert teams, while objective weights were assigned by decision-makers. Hence, the overall portfolio decision discussions became more focused and resulted in specific decisions that had previously taken much longer, often without reaching a decision. We built a tool that automatically integrated the inputs of various early stage assets. We developed a dashboard that facilitated trade-offs and agile decision-making in the future by summarizing the key insights in a holistic manner. In addition, the debiasing measures were put in place to continuously improve the quality of assessments and model inputs. This summary slide and another slide with some details on the approach are available as handouts which you can download. Back to you. Um, uh, yeah, Deepak, I need to uh, ask you a question here already. And that is, you said a couple of times, uh, you talked a couple of times about efficiency and being agile and so forth. And agile sort of, you know, a pretty common buzzword these <laughs> days. Um, where is the efficiency actually visible? In using this approach? So um, it took us, so, um, uh, once we set up the process, um, the project teams, when they were not exposed to this process and they were actually looking at this framework and the process and the templates for the first time, they took about an hour to complete the project reviews. And on the second time onwards, it was much more efficient. So think about project teams doing a, um, a portfolio review and spending just less than 30 minutes each time. That was one area where there was a lot of improvement. Second, um, the decision makers, uh, in this example, decision makers used to spend a couple of days typically looking through each of the projects in a lot of detail, often being unable to decide and having follow-on conversations. When we did this exercise, they were able to complete the decision on the portfolio reallocation within an hour. So a lot of time was saved because comparability of projects was a given and they were able to think about the way forward. It sounds like the decision makers knew what they were looking for in that um, mountain of information that they usually get on projects. Right? Look at it, um, they were the ones who gave the criteria. So yeah. that they did not have to spend time on thinking about the criteria. Yeah. But there's the upfront effort of getting to the fundamental objectives, nevertheless, right? That is correct. Um, before I forget, 
um, I want to tell you that there's the, about the next webinar coming up um, in July. Um, it's called Embracing Uncertainty to Sharpen Scenario Planning and Forecasting. And it's going to take place on Wednesday, July 7th. Uh, our speaker is Bruce Judd, um, partner with SCG. Um, and so please you know, go ahead and, and register if you're interested. Um, I think we have some time for uh, some questions today. And um, I've been getting a list of these questions right now. And I'm just going to sort of start from from the top here um, and um, maybe read one of them here. Um, based on what we've heard today, the question has come up, um, is there a place for expected net present value in early portfolio evaluation? Or should the focus be entirely on the multi-attribute uh, approach and preference weighting approaches? That is an interesting question, and I get asked these questions quite a bit. Um, so NPV is typically used where the frame is narrow and there's a lot less uncertainty. What, when the frame gets broader, then it's more difficult to use NPV, and the decision makers also do not believe in NPV as a tool to differentiate options. So early stage decisions is the one where the frame is typically broader, you're looking at a longer time horizon. And in the end, it is also up to how much the decision makers believe in the use of NPV. Typically, they do not. And hence, um, the, the MOUT methodology or any multi-criteria decision-making methodology is more useful in an early stage process. So a narrow frame in, would be something like, you know what the, the indication is going to be in the end or something, right? Um, Correct. You, okay. you may launch the product in a couple of years. You're already in the late stage trials. So yeah. you know what you're doing. And you would treat it just like a late stage evaluation, right? Yeah. yeah. But if you don't know where you're going, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Uh, another question um, uh, is um, how do you compare early stage projects to late stage projects? I guess, you know, our discussion sort of led into that already, but. Sure. So. I'm assuming that uh, we're talking about uh, resource allocation and buckets uh, for early stage and late stage, um, because typically the, the amount of investment in an early stage single project is not comparable to the amount of investment in a late stage project. So what we're essentially talking about is buckets. So what is the resource allocation between an early stage bucket and a late stage bucket? And this, in a way, um, is dependent on the overall objectives of decision makers. I mean, if you're looking to increase the throughput, if you're looking to increase the number of projects that uh, come from the um, discovery, research, and development pieces of it, then you would spend more money uh, and more, have more resource allocation for the early stage compared to the late stage. So it is a question of the company objectives and the current status of that particular company and what they're looking to drive forward. Yeah, and I'm hearing that it's also a, a bit about the frame on the problem. You mentioned the word throughput, right? Are you trying to get more throughput or are you trying to compare projects at the same stage? Yeah. Correct. We've, um, we've talked a lot about pharma and I'm gonna pick a question now that's the non-pharma one. Um, um, energy infrastructure, right? It says here the energy infrastructure, I guess question, right? Has many stakeholders. Um, often with conflicting objectives. Um, can you uh, describe how the approach can be used in this environment? Um, yes, um, and, and we are already uh, working with energy companies in this manner. So the problem is similar in energy space. So what we are talking about and what are the ideal conditions where you can use this approach is when you have conflicting objectives amongst the decision makers. and energy right now, especially the energy transition um, topic, has multiple objectives. People are looking to do different things. And whenever you have conflicting objectives among decision makers, we could use this method to surface their individual objectives and use that to then develop scales that are appropriate for the particular decision problem. So you use then use that scales that you've developed to um, identify and support the decision-making in the energy space as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, I can imagine that's very challenging. Um, and uh, that actually leads to the, the next <laughs> question that I can see on the list here is um, what key challenges have you identified in, in using this approach? Um, are there, uh, it says here, are there situations where the approach does not work well? <laughs> that's, that's important to know when, when people are, are starting to use the approach. Um, the most, the, I talked about two challenges uh, as I went through the process. One is getting decision makers to reveal their fundamental objectives and having the trade-off conversations with the decision makers. So essentially what you're asking the decision makers to do is to trust you and reveal their preferences, reveal what they want to achieve from a particular decision or even how do they translate the company objectives. And that is normally tricky because decision makers are, you need to create a very trustworthy environment where decision makers can reveal that. So you need the buy-in and support of the decision makers upfront if this effort needs to be successful. I've seen examples where, where the decision maker support is not there and people have tried to um, do without their preferences, without knowing what their preferences, and then you would be in the cycle where you would have to keep changing your alternatives because the decision maker wants something else. So decision maker buy-in is critical for the success of this uh, approach. Yeah, and this sounds, um... This answer is, is not surprising because um, in helping prepare decisions, structure them, um, pro provide an evaluation, it's all um, a process to serve a, a customer, uh, which is the decision maker, right? And if you don't have them on board, uh, right, you will fail, right? So um, as always, engaging the, the decision maker uh, as the customer, the process is actually pretty important. That's what I'm hearing. Um, I was looking here for more decisions, but I also see uh, more uh, questions, but I also see we're, we're coming actually to the end of our time right now. Um, and so um, I'm gonna um, say thank you, Deepak, for uh, the uh, very interesting presentation. And thank you to all the participants um, for uh, joining us today. We had a very good turnout and I hope you will turn out for our, our next um, webinar. Um, the, uh, the handout that Deepak mentioned um, is available for you and um, feel free to reach out to us if you have um, any questions on this subject going forward. Um, and I, uh, I'll hand back to, um, to Lindsay now. Thank you, Mark and Deepak. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar.